<laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Julia from the Master Public Library. And of course, joining me is Brian, who is going to talk about our journey to another star. <laughs> Hello, my pupils. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought I'd talk today about uh, what it might take to go to another star system. Um, there's there's some interesting things. You always see this in science fiction. We want to travel to other stars and, you know, go boldly where no one has gone before, all of that. Um, and, and the thing is, is that while that is science fiction, people have thought very seriously about what it would take to go to another star system. Um, and it gets kind of more interesting because I think I've talked earlier about uh, exoplanets, planets around other stars. Well, it turns out that we now know that uh, there is a planet that is a little bit more massive than Earth. It's roughly Earth in size that orbits the closest star to the sun. And not only is it the, about the mass of the Earth, it is also it, within what's called the habitable zone, meaning that it could be the right temperature to have liquid water and possibly even life, if that were the case. So, so we know that the nearest star has um, at least one and probably two planets that we know of. Uh, it probably has more planets we just haven't found yet. So, so not only are there planets throughout the universe, there's a planetary system around the closest star. So one star over from the sun is a planetary system. And one of those planets happens to be potentially habitable based on what we can tell. So, so there's a lot of interest in being able to go to another star system. Now, the, the real big problem though, is that space is huge. So when we talk about the nearest star, the very nearest star, that's a star known as Proxima Centauri. And it's 3.2 light years away. So when we say something is a light year away, that means that if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you one year to travel a distance of one light year. So when we say some, that Proxima Centauri is 3.2 light years away, that means that it even takes the light from that star a bit more than three years to reach us. So even if we didn't travel, even if we just sent messages back and forth, it would take 3.2 years for our message to get to Proxima Centauri. And it would take 3.2 years for their message to get back to us. That's how huge it is. And to give you an idea of scale, the farthest we've been to is the moon. And the moon is one light second away. So it only takes light one second to reach the moon. And that's the farthest we've, we've ever traveled in, in terms of humans. Um, and, and we're talking about light years. And so when you're talking about that level of distance, the problem is, how do you get there? You know, um, obviously, we're not going to send people anytime soon. You know, we, we went to the moon a few times. We'd like to go to Mars. We probably have the ability to go to Mars within the next 50 years. But even Mars is somewhere on the order of 30 light minutes to 60 light minutes away from Earth, uh, depending on where it is in its orbit. So it's less than an hour by light time. Uh, and we're again talking about years. So, so um, I think the farthest space probe that has ever been sent out is uh, Voyager 2. And it's I want to say it's about seven light hours, six light hours away. So this has traveled since, you know, the 70s. And, and it's still only a few hours at the speed of light out. So, so light years is a huge level of distance. And 
even back in the 50s when people were hadn't even gone to the moon yet there were ideas of well how might we get to another star system and pretty early on it's clear that ordinary rockets won't cut it so the rockets that we use on spacex or going to the moon or the space shuttle or anything like that um, they are chemical rockets they use chemical fuel and the way they move forward is to basically throw hot gas out the back end with a chemical reaction and that pushes the rocket in the other direction and while that's great for launching off of earth it's great for going to things like the moon and mars um, the problem is that in order to go on the order of light years you have to get up to some decent level of speed if you I don't know the math off the top of my head, but basically, if you had conventional rockets, it would take a spacecraft with conventional rockets about 50,000 years to get to Proxima Centauri. So, so we're not going to do that with regular rockets. Um, now, back in the 50s, there was a lot of proposals to do, instead of chemical rockets, to do some type of nuclear rocket. So there was something called the Orion Project or Project Orion. And the idea with that was to, once you throw this spaceship up into orbit around the Earth, uh, you would get it out to the outer star system or, or you know, to another star by launching nuclear bombs. So basically, you would throw a nuclear bomb out the back end, ignite it, and the explosion would push your, your rocket forward. And while that seems kind of crazy, nuclear bombs are much more efficient with energy. And so they're far more efficient than chemical rockets. And so they could push a rocket farther. Um, there's still a problem though. And, and that is any type of rocket, whether it's a chemical rocket or a nuclear rocket or anything, in, in order for them to work, you have to throw some type of material out of the back end very quickly. And basically there's this, they call conservation of momentum. When you throw something, it pushes you back in the opposite direction. So you might have felt this if you've ever gone bowling or something, and you you toss a bowling ball and you can feel it pushing back against you. You know, um, the same thing is true with rockets. So so you have to throw this stuff out the back end. But the problem is that once you throw it, it's gone. So if you want to keep thrusting, you got to have more fuel to throw out the back end. And once you've thrown that out, you still have to have more fuel to throw out the back end. So what that means is, in order to keep thrusting, you have to take fuel with you. So not only do you have to push the, the gas to get your rocket going, you have to uh, carry all the extra fuel that you're gonna need later with you. Now, with going into something like an orbit, going to the space station, for example, if you've ever seen the, the SpaceX launch or anything like that. They just had the, the Dragon SpaceX launch. That's done in stages. So what they do is they launch the rocket, they get to a certain height, and then they drop part of the rocket. They just let that detach so that now they don't have to carry it all with them. They basically use up the fuel there and then let it go. Then they have another rocket and it uses up fuel and then they let it go. Then they have another rocket, you know. And, and if you remember, uh, the moon mission, it had three large stages to get towards the moon. So you had this huge rocket, you know, it's the size of a skyscraper, and all they have is this little lander. So if you remember the, the uh, Apollo missions, you know, the Saturn V was this huge tall rocket. When you'd see it on television, there's this little dot up there, and that's where the three astronauts are because it takes all of that rocket fuel, that whole thing basically full of fuel, just to get to the moon. So the problem is that the farther you wanna go, if you wanna go in some reasonable time, the farther you wanna go, the faster you need to go. But the faster you need to go, the more you have to have rocket fuel. So that means that you have to have more and more rocket fuel in order to get faster and faster. But that means that you need more and more rocket fuel to push the rocket fuel that you need to go faster and faster. So, so no matter what type of fuel you use, you would have to have so much weight in rocket fuel or in nuclear fuel that it becomes diminishing returns. 
So, so basically you have the vast majority of your rocket is just fuel and the structure to hold the fuel. And then you have this little tiny rocket. And, the, and if you wanted to go to another star system, the amount of fuel that you would have would be vast compared to this little tiny spaceship. So if you had something the size of the space station and you wanted to go to another star system, you'd have to have a fuel load bigger than an asteroid just, just to try and get there. And even then it would take you thousands of years. So, so we're not going to do that. That's just not possible. Um, there have been some science fiction stories about something called a generation ship. You basically build this huge spaceship that's like a self-contained artificial earth and and you put people in it and you let them live their lives have children have grandchildren have great grandchildren and then finally their great 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 grandchildren uh will reach the other star system because it takes so long to get there you know and regardless of the ethical ideas of that you know usually the science fiction stories have everybody forgetting that they're on a spaceship and then when they arrive at this planet they don't know what to do because you know, imagine trying to keep the peace uh, on a small space in quarantine, basically. You know, let's put a thousand people in quarantine for six generations and, you know, see how that works. <laughs> so, so these ideas aren't practical. So there's been a lot of thought about, well, how could we possibly do this, you know, and unless we figure out something like warp drive or faster than light travel or some type of really exotic science fiction thing, it seems like the only real practical solution is to have a rocket that doesn't have to carry its own fuel. So you have a rocket that can be powered by something else. And you know that might seem a little bit crazy. How can you actually have power if you're not taking it with you? And, and the idea is that um, if you could do this, one of the things that we could do is instead of using fuel, instead of using tossing hot gas out the back end, what if we use light? And, and there's an interesting property of light that is if you shine a beam of light against a reflective surface, it will bounce off. And that means the light has hit and bounced off and it gives the, the reflective surface, the mirror, just a little bit of a push. Now, we don't notice this in everyday life because the push that light gives something is extraordinarily small. But that's okay because if you're not carrying your own fuel, there's two ways to get up to a, some, some kind of speed. One is you could take the kind of Ferrari way, which is basically floor it, use up all your fuel really fast and hit 60 miles an hour in less than three seconds. Okay, fine. The other way would be to use the, the, the Yugo uh, idea, which is you just have a little bit of acceleration, but you keep accelerating and you keep accelerating. So you do a very slow ramp up to speed, but you still get there in the end. You still get to 60 miles an hour. It just takes you three minutes instead of, two seconds, you know? So the idea of this uh, using light would be suppose you have this very huge surface, you know, something on the order of kilometers across, some type of reflective sheeting, almost like a sail. And in fact, they're, they're sometimes called a solar sail. So the idea is that you would have this huge light sail, this sail that then could reflect light. And if you shine this intense light on it, then it would reflect and push off, and this would push the spacecraft in the right direction. So because you don't have to carry your own fuel, you could just keep shining light on it, and it'll just keep speeding up and speeding up, and you have less mass that you have to deal with. All you need to take with you is the mass of the spacecraft and the sail. And the sail would be really light. It would just be really large. So, so this has actually been proposed. It's often called a light sail um, spacecraft. Uh, we have done a couple of small experiments that have shown that it's feasible. 
So the Planetary Society launched two small spacecraft, Light Sail 1 and Light Sail 2. Uh, and both of them showed that you can use sunlight to actually change the motion of the spacecraft. So these two were very small spacecraft. They were not, they were like what they call CubeSats. So they were about the size of a softball. They'd spread out to this couple meter wide sheet of, of reflective surface. And they didn't travel anywhere far. All you showed was that, wow, you can actually change the direction of the spacecraft slightly using sunlight. So, so we know that this idea of light sails could work in principle. So the next thing is, how can you possibly um, use it effectively? Well, one of the problems of just using sunlight is that it works great if you're fairly close to the sun. If you're around the distance of Earth, then the sun is nice and shiny and you, know, you can get a good reflection off of it. But if you're out at the distance of Pluto, then the sun just looks like a very bright star. You're not getting a whole lot of light from the sun. That's why Pluto is all icy and cold. Um, if you go beyond that, Pluto is still well within our solar system. We have to go way out to go to Proxima Centauri. And so there wouldn't be enough sunlight to really power it. So even with a light sail, um, you couldn't just use sunlight to go to Proxima Centauri in some reasonable time. But you can produce light artificially and we can do it fairly efficiently. And the most efficient light source that we can produce is a laser. So what we could do is we could have solar powered lasers. So there is a project called um, Breakthrough Starshot. It's funded by a billionaire who is pushing this idea of sending a spacecraft to another star system. And the basic idea of this is to say, okay, we gotta have two things. One, we have to have our spacecraft be fairly small and light. So, so they're talking about having a very miniature uh, spacecraft. How can you have a spacecraft that can have all of its sensors that's the size of a matchbox that weighs 100 grams or 200 grams? So they're talking about a very small spacecraft. So one of the things they have to do is to be able to miniaturize all of this so that they can send this spacecraft out there and it's not too heavy. The other thing is you then connect this to this light sail and you give it a push with lasers. So the idea is that you would have uh, solar powered lasers in orbit around the sun. They would gather solar power and they would create a very focused beam of light specifically on this spacecraft. So they would put a very narrow beam on the spacecraft that would give it a push. When you do the basic math on what they would like to be able to do, um, you should be able to get this up to about a tenth of the speed of light. Now, if you can get it up to about a tenth of the speed of light, then you could go to Proxima Centauri in about 40 years. Now, that's still a long time, but that is something that we could actually plan as a society we could say, we're going to launch this in, let's say, 2050. And it would reach Proxima Centauri by 2090. And three or four years after that, we would get the data. So before the end of this century, we could actually be getting images and data from this sort of planetary system around another star. Um, and that's, what they're feasibly talking about. If we can, can figure out some of those engineering challenges, it could be possible to reach Proxima Centauri within this century, the end of this century, but within this century. Um, if you can make it small enough, if you can get the funding for it, if you can do all of that. But, but the big exciting thing about that is that, that the engineering problems that we're facing are, are not revolutionary, they're evolutionary. So, so we need a nice thin material uh, that's very reflective. Well, we have thin materials that are very reflective. There are, there are things that are called um, 
uh, carbon sheeting, carbon nanotube sheeting, like graphene. Um, that is just this sheet of carbon. It's, it's only an atom thick. You could do several layers of that and have a nice reflective surface that only weighs a few grams. Um, we are just about to the point to be able to make large sheets of this. And if we can make large sheets and figure out how to fold it up and then unfold it in space, we could have a solar sail that we need. The miniaturization of sensors that we have in cell phones and other technology um, are getting to the point where we can't quite get to 100 grams, but we could get to a spacecraft the size of your cell phone, which is pretty small. So in another 10, 20 years, we should be able to get to within the size of spacecrafts that we need. Um, lasers are a well-known technology. We know how to make lasers. The, the real only challenge is being able to connect the solar power to the power of the lasers and putting it into space. We just haven't used lasers in space much, although we can do that. You know, it's, it's one of those things that it's like, we don't need some revolutionary new science. So, so it's really an engineering problem that would take us to go to another star system. Um, so we're within range. And, and so this has been talked about a lot, but what's really starting to get exciting is that not only do we have the ability to within you know, several decades be able to launch a spacecraft to another star system, but we also have the ability to know what will be there. We now know that there are planets going around Proxima Centauri. We now, you know, within another 10 or 20 years, we should be able to know what more planetary systems there are, um, what its gravity is like, which way we might deflect it to get close to one of these planets. We'll know the orbits well enough. So, so within, you know, certainly within the next century, um, it is possible that we could make the first space probe to another star system and see not only planets around other stars, but uh, possibly a, a planet that is warm liquid water and maybe even life. We don't know yet. So, so it's, it's still a challenge, but, but we're very close. Any questions on things? So what would power the lasers once they're in space though? I mean, wouldn't you have to have fuel for the lasers? Well, this is the thing. You can create laser light from electrical power. Like most of, like a laser pointer, for example, is powered off of a battery. Right. A, a battery, you could just replace the battery with a solar panel. So you could have an array of solar panels that would provide power to a battery system inside this spaceship laser and then the laser would produce it. But once it's out past Pluto and stuff, would you get enough starlight to... Well, see, that's the thing. You wouldn't put the lasers out past Pluto. You put the lasers um, either around the, the orbit of Earth or closer, say, put them around Mercury. Because what happens is you just need the power, and then you just aim this beam of light. The nice thing about a laser is it's very focused. It doesn't spread out much over time, or over distance. So it's, it's got a very narrow kind of focus. So you could be at Mercury and you could point it in just the right direction to hit a spacecraft a light year away. But then you got the asteroid belt. To go the through. asteroid belt is mostly empty space. It's, it's always, we always portray the asteroid belt as being something that the Millennium Vulcan has to swerve through <laughs> to avoid all the rocks. It's not, it's, it's very, very empty. Even okay. though there's a lot of rocks there, um, there's a lot of space there. Okay. So I think I did the math a while ago. It would be like, um, imagine going through from, from the, um, the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains, all of that part of the United States, and you'll find one rock the size of a softball. Just drive anywhere you want. How often do you think you're going to hit it? Mm. Okay. You know, the chance of hitting it is, is basically zero, you know, and so the, the, the chance of it blocking the light is almost zero. And if it did, if an asteroid happened to pass in front of the beam, it would just get, oh, got lit up and then move on. Right. Okay. 
and then you'd still have that same laser light still focusing. So it would just kind of go a little dip of shadow. And, and that wouldn't be the only laser. You'd have multiple lasers. Okay. So it would be just like, you know, a little bit of light, so whoop, and that's it. So likewise, damage to the sail wouldn't be very likely either. Right. So, so as far as we know, damage to the sail would not be very likely. And if it were, it would be fairly small. Okay. So, so you'd have very tiny little things that, that might. And in fact, some people have proposed um, having enough power to um, kind of have some type of magnetic field that would deflect some of the littler stuff. Now, there could be a chance that there's something, you know, if something the size of a, of a softball happens to be in its path and it's traveling at, at a tenth of the speed of light, we'll see a flash and that's it, <laughs> you know, because the amount of energy that it would have going to this, to this little rock, uh, it would vaporize the rock and the spaceship would be gone, <laughs> you know. But again, the chances of that are really, really small, you know. We've sent probes out through the asteroid belt. Um, we have sent them into the outer solar system. We've never had a collision. Okay. In fact, we've actually had to work really hard to get close to some of them. Like you have to have this really careful navigation to get close enough to some of the rocks to take pictures. Wow. So, okay. So the random chance is, is really, really tiny. Hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, Brian. So, Julia has a question real quick. What was it? So, how would we get something in satellite around another planet? Um, that's not in the design of the Starshot mission. The, the idea of the Starshot mission would be that it would just go to this other solar system and zip past, take a whole bunch of pictures, and then send the data back. So, it's kind of like the Pluto mission. It would just go and then be on its way. Right. So, so there has been some talk. Um, there's a science fiction writer who's also a physicist, Robert Forward, and he had an idea of using two solar sails. So this idea of using a laser to send it there, and then the outer, he'd have an outer solar sail that would detach and speed ahead of the satellite, and then that light, laser light would sit there and reflect back and slow down the spacecraft. So you would reflect it off of the sail to slow it down. Um, that's the only thing I've seen that, that would be, you know, kind of enough to really get to that. Some have thought, you know, maybe if you take a solar sail and bring it in close to the star Proxima Centauri, you might be able to have enough uh, light pressure to slow it down. And then you could have little thrusters or something to get it into orbit around another planet. Um, that's, again, that's more sophisticated than what people are talking about right now. There are ways to possibly do it, but the engineering is, you know, a whole other level. Um, you know, going into orbit around a planet is much more difficult than just going kind of close to a planet, particularly if you're moving fast. Mm -hmm. So, and, and for most of the things that we've had going into orbit, we've used, you know, either slingshot things or air braking or things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Not enough is known about like wormholes and things like that that we could experiment with that. You know, we'd love to have wormholes and, and warp drive and everything. Um, they are, there are ideas that, that scientists have actually worked on. Um, the, the evidence we have is kind of probably not. Um, I could do another, I could do like next next week on on just like wormholes and warp drive and all the science fiction ideas that people are talking about. But sure, okay, so we can we can plan on that then. Okay, yeah. but yeah, it's it's interesting ideas, but but it's still science fiction at this point. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, we every, every scientist who dreams about this is like, yeah, that's what we want. But things that was science fiction fifty years ago do have some. Yes, as Julia points out, things that are science fiction 50 years ago do have some, some reality in today. Yep. You know, of all the things in Star Trek, we, we do have little communicators now that can talk to spaceships, and we do have people in space, and uh, you know, we do have computers that can recognize our voice and talk to us, and touch screens. So all of those things that were in Star Trek 
we do have them. We just don't have the real cool one of warp drive <laughs> transporters, you know. <laughs> That's what I want. Transporter. We still need, you know, and we just still need Scotty for that. So. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Brian. You're very, very welcome. Always. Have yep. a good week. Oh, you too. Okay. Next Bye. week. Talk Bye. to you later.